So, one of the seven principles of the company is exclusivity. Mm -hmm. And normally 100 is pretty exclusive, but we're only making 25 T50Ss. That's right, yeah, we wanted this to be even more exclusive. And uh, we had a lot of fun with the, with the naming strategy as well. So, first of all, T50S, Nicky Lauda, after yeah. one of your, one of, you've had some great drivers, but Nicky's right up there. Yeah, oh, definitely, yeah. And, and it, it was a sort of a, a horrible coincidence, really, that he died just a year before we sort of started getting this towards the launch. And uh, I just thought it would be a really good tribute to Nicky for a couple of reasons. One, as you say, you know, he was one of my favorite drivers and became a very good friend. But also, he was the one with the win in the fan car in Sweden. Yeah. So there's the second connection. And uh, I think the family were very happy that we, um, we attributed the, the, the car to Nicky. So naming strategy, they're all, each one of the 25 is named after one of your F1 wins. Yeah, that was another bit of, that was just a bit of fun really. Caused quite a bit of interest with the owners, I think. The idea was to give each car a little bit of prehistory so it would always stay that particular motor car. And I did it chronologically. So I wrote down all the tracks I'd won a Grand Prix on, but in chronological order. And we just lined them up with the chassis. So for example, 01 is Kyle Army 74. So that car will always be the Kyle Army car. And it comes with a special book and a plaque and a chassis plate. And initially we didn't tell the, the owners, the buyers, because we thought there would be a mad scramble. Everybody would want one or two tracks. But when we got down to the last sort of eight cars, we then, we opened up to the owners and said, you know, we've got these eight tracks left and people were picking tracks. And have the owners had fun with the specking sessions? Oh yeah, we've just started actually. We've only just started. I, I'd love every car to be different again, and I'm sure they will be. And some people want homage to the, um, to the actual race winner on that track with that livery and our, our people in the studio and are having a lot of fun coming up with these uh, sort of concepts, art cars almost. I was uh, going to say Kevin yeah. and his team will be having all kinds yeah, of fun, won't they? Absolutely, yeah. So um, I really can't wait to get into the, into the meat of the, of the specking sessions. Nice. Talk me through this mirror. <laughs> I mean, we've got cameras <laughs> well, we had... on 50. <laughs> When we, when we were using the CFD wind tunnel, we stuck the mirrors on the model and the turbulence from the mirror, we lost 5% of the downforce on the rear wing from the, a turbulent section coming back off the mirror. Uh -huh. And we looked very closely at Formula One cars and they use, um, some of them use this trick where you have an inner mirror and an outer shroud and then you have an annular groove, uh, annular slot actually, yeah. where the air comes through and that straightens up the airflow. And we did that and we, immediately got our 5% back. It's all in the details, isn't it? And I see the pedal tube. Yeah, well, that's, that's another sort of nod to the fan car, really. On the road car, the static pressure measurement is, is hidden in one of the uh, rear view cameras. Yeah. Uh, we didn't want to see it. And of course, you've got pedestrian uh, projections that your car's got to be all smooth and round. But on a racing car like this, um, having, having this little conning tower with the, uh, <laughs> the pitot tube and the aerial, um, it was, again, it's a little nod to the fan car. So with the fan car, the pedal tube was connected to, was there not a pressure gauge in the car? It was, yes. We went to a, a breaker's yard for aeroplanes uh -huh. and we came back with two altimeters. And on every aeroplane you see the pitot tube sticking out the side mm -hmm. uh, like this, sticking out the side of the nose. That measures the difference between the static and dynamic pressure and that gets converted into feet for an altitude. That's how it works. Um, I just marked the gauge. We were measuring the difference, just the same. But we were just worried about the suction underneath the car. So we were measuring the static pressure with the pitot tube and the dynamic pressure was the suction underneath the car. And I just had a green section and a red section. And I told the drivers, before you go into every corner, just make sure it's in the green. Because <laughs> if you've got a broken skirt, you're gonna fly off the road, basically because our entry speed on a third gear corner was 30 miles an hour quicker. And uh, Nicky said he drove the whole race, not looking at the rev counter. He just looked at the, looked at the game oh, the whole race. <laughs> <laughs> but the performance was worth it, wasn't it? Uh, definitely. <laughs> Should we go look at the engine in the back end? Yep. So on our left, we have this wonderful GMA V12 by Cosworth. 
you can see that you can really see the differences. I guess for us spending as much time around this around T50's engine, yeah. you can really see the difference. Yeah, the the sort of visual differences are, are the obvious ones, like the you know the, the Ram airbox, 70s Formula One, and of course the brand new exhaust system without the cats. The rest of it is is very sort of internal, apart from on the back. Now we've just got these blanking plates where the variable valve timing went. So those are the sort of physical differences. Everything else is inside the motor. You said about the exhaust, I mean, we love noisy cars, but if you have to meet noise limits, there's a whole silencer uh, kit, isn't there? That's right, yeah. We've got, I think it's three levels of, of silencing. Um, well, open pipes and two levels, I think, under that. For the lucky people that can run it on open pipes, it's gonna sound magic. We've got to be at least run a couple of days on open pipes, well, haven't yeah. we? We've got to definitely. run it on everything just for yeah. you know, Def scientific definitely. purposes. Yeah. <laughs> Going back to the to the gearbox now yep. and the suspension, you said it was thin, <laughs> these steel wishbones. That's ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, these. this is a, a very good quality steel, of course, but uh, it's it's all been uh, designed against the, the loads, the extra loads it's got to see. So the, the analysis work has all been, of course, on the uh, the high, on the high mu you get from the um, tyres. And has this been, you know, you said with, with 50 compared to F1, a lot of it was modern simulation tools and you could actually make things lighter because of, of modern simulation stuff. Is yeah. this a, an example of that? Uh, uh, ab absolutely, yeah. And, and also I wanted, on the road car, always wanted forged aluminium. Um, it's, it's the right material for limited volume production road car. But for the racing car, when you really want the nth degree and the factor of safety is slightly smaller, um, going back to steel was the right thing to do. Now the gearbox, paddle shift. Yes, I thought, um, much as everybody loves the H pattern on the road, I thought it was just a bit too much on a car doing those sort of speeds. <laughs> so we've got, this is x um, instantaneous gear shift, which actually is essentially a pre-selector gearbox, so it's already in the next gear. So all you do is release the gear you're in, so it's a completely seamless change. I can't wait to, to experience that. I mean, little things like the, the drive shaft. Very thin wall though, yeah. so these are obviously tubular. Yes. And a very, very thin wall. Again, going back, that's, that's modern. And integrated CV technology. joints and output flange like a Formula One car. In fact, this is very much Formula One. I sent style. you pictures of the day, didn't I, of, of, of uprights of an F1 car from about five years ago. Yep. Very similar. Very similar. Yeah, very similar. Yeah, very similar. Yeah. The bearing arrangement too is, is very Formula One. So you were saying earlier, that this is a, a complete new car, new tub, mm, everything. Yeah. I think this shows it very well, doesn't it? It does. The actual monocoque is different in virtually every way. So, for example, the ram induction box and the fin are actually molded as part of the structure. I didn't want those things to be bolt-on or add-on because that would be a lot heavier. Mm -hmm. um, so that's all part of the main structure. And, of course, we've been able to thin things down a lot on the layout. The body is actually all a lot thinner than the road car, so we've just saved, we've saved weight everywhere. Everything's just pushed a little bit closer to the limit, which you can afford to do on a track car. And it's not painted, it's wrapped. That's right, yeah, that saves quite a bit of weight. And it looks beautiful, the finish on it. I was, yeah. I was really surprised. Yeah, yeah, I was very impressed with the job the guys did. Yeah, and you went back early, you said, you know, the finish on the car is, is you, you were pleasantly surprised. It's a, it's a prototype, it's XP1 yep. of a track car, and it looks, production car ready to be. It is pretty much. I mean, I'd be very close to signing that off as a production car. So by the time we've built our handful of prototypes uh, and tested them, by the time we get into production, the car's going to be truly perfection. I yeah, think. that's yeah. an impressive job by the team, isn't it? Yeah, no, they've, they've done all... a great job. Well, Gordon, thank you so much for your time. That's been a lot of fun. Um, and thank you all for watching. This is the first step in the T50S journey. I hope you'll join us for the other ones. We'll see you next time.